so so Dante says, Virgil says that you know wax is wax. Do you know what we mean? Do you 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 put soft melted wax on something and then you stamp a seal in it? Do you guys know what I mean? Um, uh, I have one that you can seal. People used to seal letters. You drip, you light the thing, and you drip the wax, and then I have a, it's a little rose that I can put the seal on. I have a little Celtic cross. Um, uh, so, so the wax is the wax. But if my seal is, because um, I'm civilized, um, if the seal is broken or chipped or not carved well, it doesn't matter if I have the best wax on the planet. It's going to be a crummy impression. So he says, love is good. Love is like the wax. Love is a good. Not every seal makes an equal impression in that wax. You can love things that are wrong, right? Or you can love them in a wrong way. Okay. So, um, yeah, I was just thinking if I wanted to do that. So these guys, it was Morgan Freeman and Christopher Walken and William H. Macy. Um, so they each loved this piece of art, but... At which was a morally fine thing because they're be beautiful, all right? However, when they found out that they were going to be transferred to the Netherlands, they decided to forge them and steal the originals and put the forgeries in the boxes to be shipped to the Netherlands, and hilarity ensues as, you know, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so when you make the decision to commit theft, to acquire the thing that your heart is drawn to, or some other sin. You've crossed a line, right? This is different than just an appreciation. So listen to what Virgil keeps saying here. Um, oh, actually, Dante's going to interrupt him. Your words and my own eager mind reveal exactly what love is, I said. But now there is an even greater doubt, I feel. If love springs from outside the soul's own will, it being made to love, what merit is there in loving good or blame in loving ill? If I see a beautiful water bottle and develop a, a mental image and an affinity for this mental image and I just cherish my water bottle, how can somebody blame me for, for that love? Like, it just happened. For example, I, some of you know this, some of you have been to my house. I really like small things, like miniatures, dollhouses and things. I just really I don't know why. I really, really, really like them. I like, there's this lady on Facebook. She makes miniature food. Oh, she made this little ham. It's all marbled with the fat and everything. I mean, it looks like you could smell the ham when you look at this. She makes little Easter eggs. She makes little tiny boxes of chocolates. Love this lady. Um, I, lo I don't know why. I don't know why. I just really, really, really like miniatures. No, no, they're all fake, but beautiful. Um, point being, is there anything wrong with that? No. It, is it something I have control over? It's not. It's just something I love. So from as early as I can remember, I got my first, like when I was three years old, for my birthday, I got some little miniature table and chairs, and I love it. So Dante says, if this just happens to you, oh, I've developed a mental image and affinity for this thing. Well, how do I get in trouble for that love? And he to me, Virgil answers, as far as reason sees, I can reply. Remember who Virgil is, human reason. As far as reason sees, I can reply. The rest you must ask Beatrice. God knows, I don't know completely. The answer lies within faith's mysteries. But here's what reason has to say. Every substantial form distinct from matter and yet united with it in some way has a specific power in it. All right. That's crazy Thomas Aquinas scholastic philosophy again. Every, we know what matter is. Behold, matter, right? Touch it. This substantial form is what I see now when I close my eyes. It's, it's the form that is, makes it what it is. I can see it right now. 
right? Every substantial form distinct from matter, yet united with it in some way, has a power. That form in my head has a power. I can see the miniature ham right now. It's so pretty. It's got a power. This la ladder is not perceivable, save as it gives evidence of its workings and effects. As the green foliage tells us a plant lives. You can't see my love for the beautiful miniature ham. But you could see me open up Facebook and go to that lady's page and, you know, and go, oh, you know, and then you see the effects of the ham, right? You can't see the love. Just like I know that the tree is alive because the leaves are turning green, but I can't see the life. Therefore, no man can know whence springs the light of his first cognizance, nor the bent of such innate primordial appetite as springs within you, as within the bee, the instinct to make honey. Like me loving the miniature ham is like the bee making honey. I don't know where it came from. I can see that ham right now in my head, Alex. And it says such instincts are in themselves not blameworthy blamable or worthy. It just is. Now that all later wills and this first bent may thrive, the innate counsel of your reason must surely guard the threshold of consent. My reason says that going gaga over dollhouse miniatures is not a blamable thing. It's not a sin. Breaking into people's houses and stealing them from them, forging the artwork and replacing them with fake, you see, their thresh, the guardian of the threshold of consent didn't order the love correctly. Yes. So uh, to take that, so what if I only spent time looking at this lady's Facebook page and I stopped making meals for my husband, ironing his shirts or cleaning up the house? Okay. Now that love is disordered, isn't it? The threshold of reason, the threshold of my consent shouldn't have given consent to spending five hours ogling, you know, little tiny chocolate miniatures. This was a bad use of my time. And Rhett, here's the trick. It happens. It would be lovely if the threshold that you shouldn't go through had big warning signs and neon signs saying, this is the threshold. Don't walk any farther. Go back, go back. Warning, radioactive, whatever. But there's not. And isn't that what we saw in hell? You know, like remember when Dante kept passing out? Oh, I passed out. Now I'm in the next level. Oh, I passed out again from grief and I'm in the next level. And then suddenly when he sees the path, he says, shoot, this path is getting pretty tough. Yes, you didn't even know. You got in so deep you didn't know. And so this is why, okay, no, I'm not, I've already gone anti-technology on you today once. Um, no, it's certain things are insidious suckers of your time, <laughs> right? Because because you get in and you don't realize it. And I, I'm speaking from experience. Like I, I know someone who uh, experienced a lot of um, failure in life through addiction to the internet, we'll just say. And not looking at bad things. Do you know what I mean? Not wicked YouTube videos, just, I don't know, how to build this or how to do that, you know, and you just like, oh, and you know, and then it recommends a million of them off to the side, like you would like this. Oh, yes, I would, you know, and then you click and three hours later, you see, so this is my, you know, I know you'll go and she's like, she's old and she grew up without computers and she doesn't understand. But it, the threshold doesn't have clear markings sometimes. That's my point. And the threshold might be different for different people. And the threshold might be different for different people. Um, when I had children at home, the ability, the, the time I had to spend on things of my own choosing was less available to me. Do you know what I mean? What would have been culpable in me as a mother of young children is not now culpable of me with nobody living in my house and I can do what I want all day. Do you know what I mean? If I had ignored my kids and read all day, this would have been wicked. 
now if I want to read for hours at a stretch and like a trunk. Um, okay, so this this is the point Virgil's making. Because remember Dante's question. Uh, hello, if I don't know why I love the miniature ham, how can you blame me for loving the miniature ham? You said it's just kind of something that happens to me. He said, oh, but you've got reason. You've got a threshold of consent. How much and where that love is going to be dished out. This is the principle from which accrue your just desserts, according as it reaps and winnows good and evil love in you. Those masters who best reason nature's plan discerned this innate liberty, and therefore they left their moral science to guide man. He's talking about Aristotle. People who, uh, the science of ethics, they all agreed. We as human beings have a will that can assent to certain acts and not assent. We have the ability to develop habits in one direction or develop habits in another direction. Or put it this way, <clears throat> all love, let us say, that burns in you springs from necessity, but you still have the power to check its sway. These noble powers Beatrice will comprehend as the free will. Keep that term well in mind if she should speak of it when you ascend. Right. All of these people, this is, the, this is the most important thing about the punishments and the rewards that you're going to read about in paradise. We have will. Our will is bent. If you've ever read C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, the first book that um, Out of the Silent Planet, <clears throat> there's a, they go to another planet that I won't tell you, and, and a bad, several of them go, and one of them is a bad guy. Anyway. The people on that planet call him bent. And they refer to Satan as the bent one. He's like, I don't know, that guy, he's bent. He's bent. You know? And I love, I love that because we our wills are bent. Some Christian traditions teach our wills have been totally obliterated. Some Christian traditions would would say we are bent. All of them agree in the fact that we're messed up. We're messed up to some degree. And we can't fix it on our own. This is where every Christian tradition comes together, right? The amount of the effect of sin on our will may be disagreed among theologians, but the fact that it is messed up and the fact that it is beyond our power now to fix it without help from God. This is Christian teaching, basic Christian teaching. All Christian groups um, agree on that. And, and so this is, this is a picture of what happens when those loves, when we, don't, when we don't make use of grace from God to order our loves right. Does that make sense? I mean, maybe this seemed just painfully obvious to you, but I feel like Dante felt like it was really, really important for us to know this. And possibly it is very easy until it happens to us. And we open up the threshold of consent to, to whatever it is. And now we don't, you just leave there. And, and we're not paying attention anymore. Um, okay, we have not quite 10 minutes. Let me see. Oh, <sighs> guys. There's something deeply wrong with my brain. Not only did I do this today, I did it yesterday. I have, this is my, these are my notes, okay? Not pretty. Do you see? This says start, and there's a big circle. And then there are stars all over. Start here. Did I talk about this yet? No. Did I start with this? No. No, I didn't even look. I write huge notes to myself, and I put stars all over, and then I just ignore them. It's like, oh, that's cute. No. And I did it yesterday. And you know what? I'm going to do this class again tomorrow. I'm going to do the same thing. I want to talk, I'm supposed to talk first, about the siren. The siren lady. This was, did you notice that early in purgatory, Dante had a dream? And he dreamed that this eagle carried him up to the front gate. And it turned out, you know, St. Lucia came and carried him. And now he's had another dream in. Canto 19. And I wanted to look at this lady because uh, I, I wanted to make the observation that we have met, you know, you know that one Canto where we met a bunch of artists, 
where they talked about Chimabui and, and Giotto. And, and of course, we're reading a poem, which is an art form. Art and imagination. Um, so I imagined the water bottle. By imagine, I don't mean it's imaginary. Do you know what I mean? Imagine for the medievals means I have a mental image now. I need to show you where that mental image is. I have a mental image of that ham right now. You know, I mean, it's just was adorable. I'm telling you. Um, and so because of that imagination, right? Image. Imagination, right? I have an image. Um, and I need to guard. I need to assess whether the image is something I should entertain or not. Um, something that we need to purify, something purgatory purifies, is our imaginations. How we see things. Listen to the deal about the siren. By the way, who, who are the sirens? Yes. Where do we meet them? In, in the Odyssey, yes, yes. Odysseus is told you got to sail past these siren ladies, right? And they're gonna they're gonna sing. And if you hear it, you will not be able to resist it, and you will sail to the island. You will row to the island, and you will shipwreck there, and and you will die. You will all die. So. Odysseus, being Odysseus, says, you know, even though they say don't listen, he's like, you know what, I'm listening. So listening to the sirens. So here's the deal. <clears throat> you all stuff wax in your ears and you keep rowing this boat. I don't care what I do. You row this boat and you tie me to that mast. Tie me up. I'm so listening. It doesn't matter if I beg you or motion to untie me. Don't do it. Just keep moving. So Odysseus encountered the sirens. And we heard in the Odyssey that the sirens said something to him like, um, we know all your trials and labors at Troy. We know what you've been through. We know all your companions who are lost. I suspect the sirens say something different to each person designed to bring you in, but also apparently beautifully, you know, with beautiful music. Okay, so Dante has this dream. There came to me in a dream a stuttering crone, squint-eyed, club-footed, both her hands deformed and her complexion like a whitewashed stone. Is she attractive? She's just not in any way, shape, or form attractive. <laughs> I stared at her, and just as the new sun breathes life to night-chilled limbs, just so my look began to free her tongue, and one by one drew straight all her deformities and warmed her dead face till it bloomed as love would wish it for its delight." She's ugly until Dante took, takes a good look. It doesn't say, I looked at her. I stared at her. Now, what is the siren? In any, anything you love that you shouldn't love. Substitute here, anything you want in love that you're opening up the threshold of consent, right? You don't love it. It's not even lovable till you scrutinize it for a while. And the more you look at it, you know, this is online shopping, right? Because you keep visiting that page, that thing you want. And every time you look, it's like, well, that's looking better and better. I think I need to order one of those. And, you know, it comes. It's not. No, no, it comes. It's not what you wanted. Either, you know, if it's an article of clothing, it looks terrible on you. Or, you know, it's just ugly. Like, what, what is that? What is this thing? No, I'm being silly, but it happens. It happens to us. So he, he doesn't see anything to attract him in this until he stares at it. And she suddenly becomes beautiful. When she was thus transformed, her tongue thus loosened, she began to sing in such a voice that only with great pain could I have turned from her soliciting. I am, she sang, Sirena. 
I am she whose voice is honeyed with such sweet enticements, it trances sailing men far out to sea. I turned Ulysses from his wanderer's way with my charmed song. Big fat lie. Ulysses did not turn from his way. Ulysses was tied to a mast and his men rode past. She's lying. Yes. Oh, the one that got away. And few indeed who taste how well I satisfy would think to stray. Her mouth had not yet shut when at my side appeared a saintly lady, poised and eager to heap confusion on the siren's pride. Oh, Virgil, Virgil, who, she cried, is this? Roused by her indignation, Virgil came. His eyes did not once leave that soul of bliss. How can you conquer it? He doesn't look at siren. He looks at the saint. He's watching that soul of bliss. He seized the witch and with one rip laid bare all of her front, her loins and her foul belly. I woke sick with the stench that rose from there. This is the siren. This is his imagination. Those mental images that we have, you see, you dwell on them, right? You replay them. Do we not all have a little movie you play in your head? And maybe the movie is the stupid thing you said this morning, and now you're sure everybody's laughing behind your back because you said the stupid thing. Or the fact that, oh, I can't believe I wore the whatever today. I look terrible in the whatever. Everybody's looking at the, you know, the stupid shirt I wore. And we can't, we play the tape in our heads. That phone conversation that just didn't come off the way, you, you just sound like an idiot. I know I sounded like an idiot. And our imagination just runs wild and makes it worse and worse and worse. Likewise, something that we think we want that we're mildly attracted to, the pieces of art, you know, in that silly movie, you know, they just became the be all and end all for those guys. They're willing to go to prison. It was a comedy. They didn't go to prison and they did get away with the art. But, um, Okay, so I'll blow it up because it seems like an old person movie to me. It feels like something that kids wouldn't like so much. So Christopher Walken is the main character, and he loves this. He loves this piece of art, and he's just built up this image, and he's so attracted to this art. And but his wife wants to go to Florida. And she's always on him. You just promised to take me to Florida. And he spends all their money, Florida money, on a forger. You know, it's like why did you spend? Anyway, so finally he's got to take her to Florida, and they go to Florida. And the picture that he loves is this woman standing on a beach, and she's like a Victorian woman, and her hair is kind of blowing. Anyway, he there at Florida, and he comes out of the water, and the water's still kind of his eyes, and he has the goggles, and he takes, and he can only see a little bit, and his wife is standing there, but she looks like the lady in the picture. So anyway, it ends by the fact that he steals the picture. And they keep all the artwork in this hidden room, and they take turns going in and looking at their art. And he goes, and he sits down, and he looks at it, but then this mental image of his wife comes into his head. And he goes, mm, and he leaves the room and goes home to his wife. It's lovely. It's a lovely ending. Because he's replaced that obsessional mental image. I mean, he has it, but he always had it. Do you know what I mean? His attention was, so maybe... I don't think this was intended to be a highly moral movie in any way, but I get moral lessons out of it. All right, finish, write your imitation and finish the purgatory for next week. It gets a little weird up at the top. Yes, Jesse, do you have? I, I did, but if you've got one, just, just leave it here. Just leave it here as you, as you or just pass it down. That's fine. Um, okay, let me shut this down. Oh, that's just like Alex's camera, but like smaller. That's kind of cool.